Oui. Sir. Worst. Always. Adam. And then. Doesn't seem like a lot of scientific research is funded by food companies. I get that impression. Yeah, me too. Because every once in a while, there will be like this sudden burst of media about, oh, blueberries are really good for you. Yeah, and it turns out it's by the Blueberry Council. Yeah, the Blueberry Council or whatever the funded all this research, you know, mm -hmm. that of course found that it's the, the best thing for you. Yeah. You should be having them all the time. It's like the, uh, and that term superfoods. Yeah. That definitely sounds like marketing jargon to me. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it totally got to me though. Like I, I have blueberries all the time because of the whole superfoods thing. Yeah. I mean, I hope there's something to it. I mean, I'm sure they're good for you. I believe that they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're but are they any better for you than other fruits or vegetables? I wonder. Right. I mean, is there something that makes them even healthier than? A, yeah. Right. A, a, it is, I don't know I a papaya or again, something because they totally do. They literally is about at least everything I've seen is about antioxidants in superfoods. Like that's mm -hmm. supposed to be this amazing thing, and yeah, I have no idea. It could be and the whole that's bunch as far of other I got with it. nutrients that they list off usually. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if they could, you know, there's going to be a, a media campaign one day about how cinnamon toast crunch is really good for you or something. That would be kind of funny. Maybe like, oh, did, did you know that cinnamon toast crunch is a superfood? It turns out that cinnamon is an anti-inflammatory and it actually, it really, it, it clears up your, all of your arteries. Mm -hmm. And the crunchy toasty things make you feel happy and that's good for you? Happiness is good for you. Yeah. Crunchiness and toastiness. There's a pie chart. It's got like a big, like a third wedge is crunchy slash toastiness. <laughs> I think that I think that that is part of why food's good for you, though. It's not just um, a physical thing, sure, but it's also the psychological of, and emotional. Yeah, definitely. And it kind of lifts your spirits. Right. That's why it never. Remember, there would be that. It seemed like maybe it started in the '60s, like around the space age, when people started really thinking about the future and. And um, they're like, oh, everything we eat, it's going to come in the form of a pill or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like, or, or you just add water to it or something and, it, and you becomes, just drink it. Yeah. Um, and it's like, that's it's really unappealing, nightmare. right? Yeah, it just sounds nasty. Part of the joy of eating is the how food is interesting, you know? Yeah. All the different textures mm -hmm. and, and of course the flavors and everything. flavors and the appearance of it and everything. It sounds like a total, like a solution by an engineer who's been locked in a closet for like a decade. I I found a solution for the humans. I mean, mm -hmm. for for us. Yeah, it sounds it's such a super scientific and rational solution. Yeah, uh, it, it, there's just no I don't know humanity to it. It doesn't take into account that there's all this imperfection and all these other things that we enjoy. Yeah, yeah, and the and the smell of it too. Definitely, and just the activity involved. People, you know, getting together in the kitchen and stuff. Gathering around. You could gather around and eat pills, I guess, but it, it still wouldn't quite It wouldn't be that cool. You could do like a scratch and sniff pill. And go to, ooh, roast beef. Yeah. I mean, if you keep going down that path, you might as well just start, hey, instead of going to the bar and drinking with people, just inject the alcohol directly into your veins. Right. Cut out the middle, man. You know, it's, it's kind of enjoyable sit, to sit down with a, a beer Mm -hmm. And just relax or whatever, smoke some weed. Mm -hmm. There are ways you could do it where it would be more efficient and it wouldn't involve all the drinking or smoking or whatever, but yeah, it wouldn't be as enjoyable, I don't think. Right. All that stuff kind of becomes, there's an aspect of almost ceremony to it or something. Where mm -hmm. just, like It becomes attached to the, what was supposed to be the main idea of like sustenance or, or intoxication or whatever. Yeah. I also think that's why like a lot of times like defecating and masturbating and urinating and stuff like that is fun too. Enjoyable. Yeah. It's about the gathering. Well, what if there were a machine that just jerked you off? You'd be like, I just need to get this done with. People do that though. Well, I mean like it wouldn't be like, um, 
a pocket pussy or something, okay. but it would just be like this mechanical this hand like, yeah, that you just put, put it, your dick into it, yeah. onto it, and it just jerks you off like really yeah. fast and efficiently. I still think some people do that. You, yeah. If you're really lazy about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The lazy man's masturbating. I wonder if it would be as enjoyable though. I think a lot of times people just like touching themselves. There's like a little bit of self-indulgence there, you know? Definitely. And if a machine were doing it, it'd just be kind of like, yeah, I just need to get some jizz out of me because it's just building up too much and I feel feel all weird because of it. You know, I've heard that sentiment a lot. Is that something... Have you ever noticed that? Do you seriously ever... I think so. That? I feel more a little more restless and like edgy. Really? I think so. So if, if once in a while, like I don't clear the pipes, you know? Uh-huh. I don't know if that's just an urban legend or not, but... Yeah. Or, and, and I just imagine it. It, get, it gets mentioned so often, at least in like, you know, comedy movies or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like It seems like a lot of times it's more part of a punchline almost or something. Yeah. But I don't know. It doesn't really seem to affect me. Really? Yeah. It's not... Well, there's the whole no fat movement. Yeah. No, it's not. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I, I'm a big fan of masturbating, but mm -hmm. it, it's not that it ever comes from like this impulse. It's like, oh, I got to I gotta I gotta clear do the pipes. This, yeah. I gotta, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I, I, it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy type thing for me because I heard it so much. I'm like, oh, I guess men need to do that. Like we need to clear it out. I've wondered this a lot and it, it could well be that it's just different for different people. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe some people really experience that. But I don't know. Yeah, I kind of, I noticed a big change in mindset definitely after I've masturbated. Like I've seriously gone from being like just the types of things I think about. I know that it's happened that like right afterward, I'll just catch myself thinking about math or something. There's a huge hormonal shift that occurs. Yeah, yeah. After that. It's just crazy. I'm like, I don't normally give a fuck about math, but here I'm like just, you know, temporarily yeah. thinking about it. I'm, and it's not like... <laughs> I mean, I'm not a mathematician, so yeah. it's not like I'm solving any problems by by having this done. It's just, I don't know. I think I kind of like being horny a little bit. I yeah, I heard a lot of mathemat mathematicians come up with theorems after they jerk off. Uh huh. Before that, they're like, I'm, nothing's coming to me at the moment. Yeah. They jerk off and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to solve this crazy problem that we've been trying to solve for centuries, you know. Pythagoras, notorious wanker. Yeah. Just every place he could get it. So is that Fermi guy? Oh, Fermi. And uh, Avogadro? No. Yeah. Not... I think that's right. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Pervert. These guys were just constantly... Mm -hmm. I think one of them in invented the pocket pussy, actually. Probably. Like the, the ancient version of it. Yeah. Imagine being in the lab when, you know, one of many mathematicians and like... Avogadro comes wandering in. He's like, oh, I, I cracked it. I finally got the new one. Well, did you wash up afterward? I hope so, yeah, because I don't want to shake hands with I'm, you or anything. I'm really that. sick of your epiphanies. Mm -hmm. It's fucking gross. I always have to go into the bathroom after that, too, and see your jizz on the wall. <laughs> he just jizzes on the wall? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that's the only way it works for him. He's like, uh -huh. I got to do it under the wall. That's, or it's that's not my inspiration. Effective, yeah. It has to hit tile. Mm-hmm. That's my thing. There's a whole thing too where sometimes sports uh, athletes or whatever they they're not supposed to have sex for some reason before yeah. they, uh, before a big game, right? Which I think is kind of a similar thing, right? You want to send them all in horny. Yeah, and like they need to be riled up and have that testosterone flowing. So I think maybe after you after you jizz, there's a little bit less of it in your body for some reason, maybe. Yeah, well, and it could be just something about. I wouldn't be at all surprised if, like you said, the hormonal shift, if that ties into just, you know, something clicks off in your body where, like, for a little while it can say, okay, we've done our, we've done our part in trying to, like, propagate whatever, and, you know, just go about the rest of your business for a while and don't worry about that. And, and you know, eventually it'll click back the other way. But that's kind of how I think about it sometimes. It's not necessarily like it's sensing how much how literally backed up you are or something but it's it's kind of just the fact that you've had an orgasm or not or something like that you know or maybe it's just some sort of urge to have sex mm -hmm. and then once you get that out of your system it's not just hormonal but it's some kind of impulse or something instinct to yeah. do that yeah and then once that's taken care of then you can kind of relax 
That stuff's really interesting to me because it still seems like it's in a huge wilderness uh, scientifically, you know, because how do you how do you do a study on that sort of thing? How do you narrow it down to whether it's like instinctive, whatever that means scientifically or for one thing or hormonal yeah. or... It's probably both. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I would love, <laughs> I'd love to see a study come out like that too. Where they're like, well, we looked hard at this for about 18 months. We had a double blind study, um, you know, several control groups. Peer reviewed um, and everything. It's a little bit of both, we figure. We're pretty sure. Was there a placebo involved? How would that work in a jizz study? <laughs> we had some guys uh, shoot sugar pills out of their dicks. Yeah. I think that's how it works. Or we told them they came when they did, really didn't. Like, really? Are you, are you sure, Doc? It doesn't feel like I, I did. I thought I didn't. I still no, feel you did. really, really randy right now. It was, it was earth shattering. We, we collected a huge sample from that, actually. The doctor fakes your orgasm. Uh, yeah. Or they they collect the jizz and then they just take shots of it and they say, oh, you didn't jizz, dude. They take shots of it? Yeah. The sample cup that it's in? They drink it? Yeah. They're like, Whoa. like they're at the bar uh -huh. taking shots of tequila. Yeah. Kind of. Kind of like that. I don't know why they would do that, but it, that either. thought just came to me for some For reason. science, I guess. Yeah, this is for science. Mm -hmm. This is the placebo. That's how they toast. Yeah, this is the placebo cohort or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now we're drinking this. Yeah. That's what he gets for being in the placebo group. That's what he gets? <laughs> yeah, so that's his <laughs> no, no, that sounds like punishment. Yeah, that's his punishment. That's what you get. That's you get, buddy, for th thinking stuff's happening when it's not. Mm -hmm. You're just tricking your own yourself into believing shit. That's not even happening. I'm not sure you'd be a very good scientist. Yeah, maybe not. If I was taking shots of people's jizz. Yeah, and you're like, this is about the placebo effect. Chastising them for no reason. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is all your fault, buddy. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Shin, you've actually completely contaminated the study uh, with, your, with your horrible practices. Well, he made me do it. That's what he gets. That SOB. It's very adversarial. It is pretty adversarial, isn't it? The other day for, um, I don't know why, but I started thinking about the Ghostbusters theme. You remember mm. that one? Yeah. That's a goofy fucking song, man. Like the more, like when it, it, all the different parts were coming to me and how it's got, like it's from the 80s, so it's got all this synth stuff going on, but it also has super heavy, almost like heavy metal style guitars and mm -hmm. really wanky solos and things going on. Yeah. So it's, it's really... Like it's simultaneously goofy and really serious, and it's like about ghosts and haunting you. But it's yeah. a comedy, so it's. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, the music fits the themes and everything. But it's like, I mean, particularly even the way it starts off, like I can't help but like laugh at it now. It's just like, boom, 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 boom. yeah, and it's like, yeah, it's it almost everything that happens gets undercut by the next thing. It seems like it's just totally goofy. So I it's, heard some weird story about that song that it was actually written originally by someone else. For the, for the movie, maybe, but then that person didn't finish it because of some sort of dispute or something. Oh. And then the next guy took it over from there, so there was already like part of a song written, and then he worked with that and then made that song. Oh, really? Yeah, it was something like that. It's, I can't even remember I'm not, who probably not one. explaining it exactly correctly, but... It, but there was sort of a handoff. There was a weird issue with it, yeah. Hmm. Like, uh, um, have you ever heard of Alan Smithy? No. There's this thing with uh, film directors... Or there used to be this thing where um, when they'd be in the midst of making a movie, because, you know, especially with traditional movie making back when everything about making a movie was super expensive from like, the film to the crew to just everything about it yeah. was an insane expenditure of resources. And so all, you know, that's why producers were involved usually was to like safeguard the funds that were going into this and make sure that they had something that was going to sell tickets by the end of the process. And so a lot of times they'd be pretty conservative with, with anybody they would hire, but especially someone like a director where, you know, they kind of have the creative lead of the whole project, you know? But so what would happen sometimes is they, they'd get a good part of the way through making a movie and all of those, those kind of bean counting forces would, would come against the director who had his creative vision for the thing. And generally, unless it's, you know, like Spielberg or somebody with an insane amount of name recognition, the, the money wins. You know, the money, the people, the producers step in and they're like, let's find the, you have this vision, but we don't see it selling. So you're going to do it this way. And so at that point, for the longest time, the director's way out of that, because he was afraid of tarnishing his name and his reputation by putting out this thing that didn't reflect his values, he'd say, all right, this is going to be an Alan Smithy film. 
they would it would go under a credit. He would detach his name from the project, and for some reason they settled on the name Alan Smithy. So there are a bunch of movies released by different directors as Alan Smithy? Yeah. No, I did not know that. The last one, the reason they stopped doing it, they probably do it just with a different name at this point, because mm -hmm. I can't imagine that ever really stopping. But in 1999, there was that movie American History X with yeah. uh, Edward Norton, and I, I think the director's name was Tony Kay. He was a mm -hmm. British guy. And it was a super high profile thing. Supposedly, a lot of the problem with that one was Ed Norton himself. Like, he had all these different ideas, and the director's like, I don't know what the fuck to do with this guy, so I want to take an Alan Smithy on this. But at that point, the project was so high profile that everybody kind of knew it was him anyway, so him doing it brought the whole Alan Smithy thing to light, and so now it's too well known for people to, to do actually it do it. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Edward Norton was pretty good in that movie. Yeah. He was a very convincing Nazi. Well, then, then he became like a reformed Nazi, I yeah. think, at the end. Yeah. But, yeah, going back to the thing you were talking about, 80s songs. Oh, yeah. But I think a lot of them, it seemed like there's something lighthearted or like kind of goofy about 80s music, but at the same time, they were super serious when they were doing it, it seems like. Yeah. Like, they weren't joking at all. Like No, it was it was heartfelt. There was, I think it doesn't seem the like there was much humor in it at all, like, mm -hmm. even though there's something slightly humorous about it now maybe i mean it's yeah it's not fu it's not funny like i it's like i'm mocking it i'm laughing at it but it's just there's something about it that's interesting that yeah, there's kind of funny you know sometimes with just the sounds themselves i can't mm -hmm. help but laugh with some of it. like it just really strikes me funny at different times and just the earnestness of the artist like singing about something that's kind of Silly, almost. Yeah. Well, and I think at this point, with the benefit of hindsight, there were some things where they were wrapped up in a, a pretty darn singular aesthetic from back then. And, you know, it was like you could catch yourself in the middle of that at the time and be like, yeah, this is how we do it. There's all these uh, wild synths and things happening and, and, and the way they would do drums and stuff. Like, everything just sounded explosive and huge mm -hmm. and dramatic. And... You know, when that's kind of the air that you're breathing, as far as like making anything, I can see doing like you. You can't always. It's kind of like if you're trying to record something and you always think, "Oh, that could use a little more reverb," and then you listen again, and you're like, "Yeah, a little more reverb would be good." And by the time you get to the end of it, you turn around and it's like all reverb. It's just totally washed out and, and reverb, echoed and gone. Yeah, I think you can kind of lose your sensitivity for how how different the sound that you're making is from what people have been used to. Mm -hmm. And if it ever does change after that, what people are going to be used to after that. So it's this weird time capsule thing for me where I listen to it. I'm like, good God, that's strange. Mm -hmm. But with that song in particular, like with the strange riffs and how like bumpy it sounds and everything, it, the image that came to mind was like, the, the real world thing would be like walking down the street and you hear, like you walk by an alley and you hear some weird screaming and stuff. And it turns out there's a lunatic in there who's just kind of, like we talked about, like people just walking down the street and they, they mutter to themselves and stuff. Yeah. But this guy sounds really violent and serious. And see, you can see it's in the dark, so you can't quite see well, but he's like waving something around. It looks really threatening. And then he steps into the light and it's, he's been brandishing a rubber chicken the whole time. That's what happens? That's all it is. Oh, okay. Was Huey Lewis, were Huey Lewis and the News involved somehow in that original? Or? It kind of sounds like a Huey Lewis song now that you mention it. They, I've might, never heard they might have been the ones that did some of it. I'm not sure though. Yeah, I could totally see that. I gotta look into that now. Oh man, I never think about Huey Lewis. Why not? I don't know. I, I didn't take him seriously at all mm -hmm. before. I can kind of see it now. And you know, oh, stepping back to 1999 again, and another American blank movie, um, American Psycho. When that, do you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how much that featured Huey Lewis uh -huh. in there. That, um, whatever. Have you read that book? No. I heard it wasn't that great. Have you? It's a pretty good book. There's Is a it? whole weird review the narrator does of albums yeah he does he does like a whitney houston album mm. and then he also reviews the huey lewis and the news album mm -hmm. and it's just really funny the way he reviews it interesting but something i guess this has been a few years ago and i can't do the math because i can't remember the different dates but it was very recently that the gap in time between that huey lewis album coming out and american uh psycho coming out was the same as the gap between american psycho coming out and now you know, like it was, that felt like a million years between when American Psycho came out, but, you know, yeah, but time it was, just passes. Mm -hmm. The movie was based on the 80s, right? But yeah. it came out in the 90s. It came out in 99. 
Oh, uh, yeah. And he, I have no idea when the Huey Lewis one came out. It might have been... Uh, it was early 80s, I'm yeah. sure. They did a good job of capturing the 80s feel in that movie, mm-hmm. even though it was from uh, 99. Yeah. Yeah, that one was a big deal. I was online once when I was reading this discussion about like a football or no a soccer game that had occurred mm. between Australia and um, was it Japan or some other Asian team and some guy on there was like why 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 is Australia playing against Asian teams because I think his thinking was Australian people are white mostly uh-huh. so they should be playing against European teams and I was mm. like uh, it's because Australia is in that region of the world it wouldn't be very convenient for them to constantly fly back and forth to Europe to play European teams, you know? Yeah. That's, but, uh, that's one of those thoughts that reveals more about the asker than maybe... And I was like, are there really people out there that, that are that stupid? <laughs> I'm afraid there are. That's just kind of a frightening thought that they're just out of, among us, you know? The stupid people? People that stupid. Yeah. I heard this great George Carlin line recently. Think of how dumb the average American is. Mm-hmm. Half of them are dumber than that. Oh. Well, the majority of people in the world are of average intelligence are lower, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, half of the people. Yeah. Well, you could also say ha- more than, or the majority of people are average intelligence or above, but. Well, the, the, we're matched. Yeah, it's 50 yeah, But 50. average is not good enough, right? Right. Well, and ser- truly, thinking of the, the intelligence of the average American, it's very hard to estimate, but. I, and I might be a bit of a pessimist on this front, but sometimes, especially politically, I think like people don't make good decisions a lot of times. Even like decisions in their own interest, mm-hmm. they're not often uh, equipped to do that. Well, there's a lot of propaganda in America that's very, right. very convincing that tells yeah. you that you should vote a certain way or else you're not a true American. Right. Even if it's not really good for you economically or... I think, Socially. I think that's almost all of it. That it's kind of it's not like people would be dumb if mm-hmm. if left to their own devices, but they're not. Like we're acted on in all kinds of nasty ways. We're marketed to and kind of controlled in a lot of ways. Yeah, similar to the food research I was talking about earlier. But then it's like uh I don't know, I think there's a lot of corporate propaganda that gets disguised as news or mm-hmm. or you know, opinions from certain people but there's like that whole capitalist agenda to it definitely that reminds me too of um there's been a a design sort of a design festival like a film festival i guess that's been planned for it's going on in the next week or two uh here in town at the northwest film forum and you know they just online they listed a whole bunch of the movies that are going to be playing and they're all on the theme of design there's uh, some interesting ones about public art and um gene splicing like the way it's almost like the movie Gattaca now evidently there are truly some ways where you can do that oh yeah CRISPR yeah right Mm -hmm. right and then there was this one called Dream Tech I think it was called and um it's about how they're they're verging on an ability to to record your dreams and sort of you know get a sense of what you're dreaming about and they were a bit coy about the specifics because they want you to see the movie and everything. But that was pretty intriguing to me. And then you look in the sort of about blurb, you know, the, the about section of the blurb. And it, it talks about how the people who put the film together are from this industry, this, this you know, infant industry that's... That profits off of like sleep stuff or yeah, something? Yeah, sleep studies, dream studies, all of this. So it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy and marketing, if they can get it out there, what a yeah. you know big deal this is and how they're on the cutting edge and everything. And I, I still want to watch it because it's an interesting subject, but then I found myself also wanting to watch it because I kind of want to see that mechanism at work of them self-promoting mm-hmm. as they're you know describing all of this stuff. But it's totally, it's like they're bootstrapping themselves. It's crazy how embedded all that stuff is into American life. Yeah. Like everything we're just bombarded with is marketing. Like information is marketing or propaganda of some sort. Mm-hmm. And it, a lot of times it, it seems totally forgiven by the average person too. They're like, oh, you know, they're just doing their thing. They're trying to make a buck. Yeah, everyone's got to make money, you know. How it's else horrendous. Mm-hmm. Like there, you can truly have a conscience and, and, you know, like there are ways to navigate the world without doing that kind of shit. It's so devious. Yeah, I'm surprised by how, how much of a pass a lot of them get. Yeah, just devilish bastards. Mm-hmm. 
What if animals needed to present passports when they crossed a border? I mean, it's, it's kind of only kangaroos that could do it, though, right? Well, what if you, what if an eagle flies across the Canadian American border? Does it have to, what if it had to present a passport? Which way is he going? I don't know. Either way. He's going, if he's been in Canada and he's coming back to America, definitely. Or no, did you say Mexico or Canada? Canada. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, either way, you could do Mexico too. Yeah. Same thing. It's going to fuck him up aerodynamically, though. That's my concern. Yeah. Things, uh, it generates some drag. But I was thinking about this because um, I went to Japan recently with my dog, you know, and my, and my oh, wife yeah. too, of course. And I was like, humans are kind of privileged in terms of traveling places. Mm -hmm. Like we could decide t to go to another part of the world. But if a dog does it, there has to be all this stuff the dog has to do. Like it has to get all these shots and has to be, might have to get quarantined and mm -hmm. has to be checked and inspected and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do too, but it seems like if a dog, a dog can't decide that it wants to go to Japan and then just go there. Well, there are many reasons a dog can't decide that it wants to go to Japan. And That's true. There. But I mean, but it's like, but if a, an animal were to cross a national border, just on foot or by mm -hmm. flying, mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't have to do all that stuff. Yeah. Why not? Is it because it, oh, it only applies to domestic animals, I guess, but not wild animals? I guess. I mean, wild animals just get a pass all, all the time. I, I find myself trying to apply societal rules to, to birds and things mm -hmm. sometimes, accidentally, you know? I do too, because I think they can be kind of annoying. Yeah, they're just hopping around and like doing something. Like, you're not supposed to be there. Making weird noises. Get the fuck out of there. I think you're violating a, like a noise ordinance right now. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I've had two birds try to shit on me recently. That mm -hmm. doesn't fly with a human. Yeah, if a human did that, they would be arrested on sight. Yeah. Pretty much immediately. Yeah. The cops would come and, you know, slap some cuffs on you. They don't even have cuffs for these things. You're being cited for public defecation. Yeah, and they just get to do it all the time. And they walk around without pants. All the no shoes, no shirt, no service stuff. Yeah. Doesn't apply. Squirrel can get in there. Dogs, yeah, that dogs can't go into restaurants a lot of times either, even right. if they're with their owners. Yeah, you know, you see those signs on restaurants a lot that says just service animals only. Mm -hmm. I, I always find myself thinking, well, I can't even go in here. I want to look through that window and see a, an establishment full of service animals drinking coffee. That would be pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I bet they'd be very well trained and yeah. well behaved. They got little vests on. Golden retriever with a vest on, just at the bar, very you know compliant and docile. That's kind of like in Japan too. I remember when we were walking around there, and once in a while you'd see a bar or something that said "No foreigners allowed." Same kind of thing, sort of. You just like this is a little oasis for mm -hmm. the service animals. That'd be pretty awesome. They gotta let off some steam. Yeah, happy hour for the service animals. They like to throw back some drinks too, you know. Yeah. But wonder what they're like when they're drunk. What What is a service animal like if it's... when they really cut loose? Mm -hmm. I bet it's pretty gnarly. I bet they I bet they really go to town there. They're so inhibited day to day. They have to unleash all that animalistic stuff that they've Un been suppressing. Unleash. Yeah, yeah, they have to unleash it. Mm -hmm. Or their owner has to unleash it. And then they can unleash it somehow. Can dogs unleash things? I bet some could. Like, you know, there are those dogs that... Oh, they can slip out of a leash sometimes. Yeah, but sometimes you'll, you'll hear about a dog that can like go and fetch a beer for his master out of the fridge or something. Mm. You know, or like... use the toilet. Right. I bet some of those dogs could learn to uh, unleash. What's it look like when an animal just is lets loose? It's like spring break. Really? Yeah, there's beach balls. They're just chasing their tails, barking simultaneously, mm -hmm. and just peeing everywhere. It pretty much looks like any dog park. They're drooling, and they're not, you know, sitting or healing or anything like that. Yeah, there's no sitting and no healing going on at all. It's a lot of dragging buttholes across, you know, carpet and grass. <laughs> And they're panting mm -hmm. and stuff. That'd be pretty awesome to see, actually. Just go to Cal Anderson Park and, on any afternoon. Dogs shouldn't be allowed to do that too much, though. It's not good for society. To see all that unleashedness? Mm -hmm. It's that wild behavior. It's, it's too envy-invoking or something? Or? It's just... 
everything will devolve into chaos if we allow that to go on too much. Oh, this is like some like a Victorian mindset almost. Sounds like mm-hmm. it's, a, they need it's to, a slippery slope, you know. They need to exercise temperance. Mm-hmm. You let dogs have fun. Next thing you know, we're going to be out, you know, fornicating in the streets and what is, slapping elderly people for no reason. It affects our humors. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. And the seven elements are unbalanced, imbalanced, or something when mm-hmm. when this happens. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, to fix it, you need like leeches and ether. Mm-hmm. It's too much wood and water here. We need more fire and and smoke. Did they really say things like that? I don't know. It doesn't sound too far off. Yeah. I was thinking of the when you mentioned quarantining, this thought popped back into my head. For some reason, I, I don't, I've had '80s pop culture shit on the brain lately. It, this was like last night. I think it came to me. Back to the Future. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! Yeah. You know, he goes back in time, meets his parents, tries to keep their prom date, you know, going so that he ends up, they end up getting married and he ends up being born and everything comes back to his present day, whatever that was in the mid eighties and everything's fine. What would really happen? This is also informed by coronavirus fears. I'm realizing that was part of what popped in my head. He'd do all that. He'd go back to the fifties, fix shit, come forward into the eighties. Everybody would be dead because he would have given them some some virus that that was heretofore unseen in the 50s and everybody in the 80s was already used to and it would just be unleashed as a pandemic like smallpox of upon something like, like that some, yeah and population without immunity or something yeah yeah it'd be kind of like that so once again totally unrealistic they should have just shown marty waking up in the morning getting ready for work taking a dump you know driving to work and then them fade to credits when just about when he gets to work like your idea worked i think so when i was a kid i i couldn't comprehend the title at all i was like no i was like i don't understand how could you go back to the future Mm -hmm. and then people will be like no it's because he goes into the past Mm -hmm. and then he has to return to the future but i'm like um but it says he's going back to the future how could you go backwards into the future yeah it's a goofy pun it took me a while to it's funny how I think there's a lot of stuff when it hits you at that age where you're just not capable of understanding things of like that. that. Yeah, and a little bit of that hangs on even into your adult life if that's mm-hmm. when you first encountered it. But if they had called it "Return to the Future," it just wouldn't have had as much of a, a good of a ring to it, right? No, right. And "Back to the Future" ends up being a fun, weird pun about it then mm-hmm. because it is wrong, and yet and it's, it's about right time. in a way. Yeah, yeah. I'm go. I'm returning to the future now. That would be a funny title for the movie. Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. In, I'm returning to the future now. <laughs> that would just totally lose the pop culture, you know, side of it there. It would just become this android talking. I remember thinking after the sec after the sequel came out, like that's really back to the future. That he goes, you know, to the future. And mm-hmm. and then it's that that was one of the things that fucked me up. And again, you know, wouldn't it be back to the present actually? And then it's back to the <laughs> back to the present is part one, and then back to the yeah. future is the next one. Yeah, but again, it's not. But he'd not have to go to the future, strange. come back to the present, and then go back to the future again to go back to the future. Yeah, he really. Yeah, you know what? I feel like we're having the same conversation that they had around a conference table, probably mm-hmm. during production meetings and things. But they must have already had the second movie in mind if they're title for the first one was back to the future i don't think so because he's going back to the present actually but for the 50s people it was the future but to him it wasn't no and the title is in his viewpoint isn't it well i I think the title is from whoever's whose ever viewpoint it takes for it to be very witty and funny oh that's all they were going for they wanted a because he's the protagonist i think everything about naming that is designed to have an average person look at it and go that doesn't make any sense. What's that about? And then you yeah. want to like learn about uh, it. and you That's true. And then at the end, you think you get it. But in fact, you don't get it because it doesn't make sense. It makes sense in its own narrow way. I disagree. I think we're going to have to leave it here. All right. <laughs> Should we wrap it up? We're, we're right there. 
How come you can't come and pee at the same time? Wouldn't that be really cool? We should have two pipes. I thought it'd be cool if the prostate could get redesigned somehow. Or maybe it needs to be redesigned. You want to play God? Yeah, then imagine how amazing that would feel. Like orgasming and peeing at the same time. Yeah. Maybe that's just too much, you know, euphoria for one person and that's why nature designed it that way. You'd be like, oh, ah, 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 ah. And then you'd die. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, peeing it feels really good, right? Especially if you've been holding it a long time. Yeah. And of course, orgasming feels good. <laughs> so they say. Combine those two. Uh-huh. And it would just be incredible. Yeah. And and what if you sneezed at the same time? Sneezes can be pretty good, too. And also just to, it's this overload of the senses, you know? I'm pretty sure something would blow out. But a sneeze feels good more because it's like, there's like this itch there that you want to kind of scratch, you know, by mm. blowing out air really quickly. But if you didn't get that itch in the first place, it wouldn't really feel good. It wouldn't be a relief. I don't know. There's a weird, there's kind of a lift that I get after I sneeze. Really? Like, this, oh, yeah, like a, nice. a release kind of? Yeah. But I didn't mean it so much as the, as far as the pleasure things go, thing goes, but more like just how totally overwhelming it is to your whole body to have a sneeze come on. Or just do all of those bo bodily functions, functions at the same time. That was the scenario I was suggesting. Sneeze, pee, jizz, fart, poop. Oh, those as well. Yeah, maybe spit even. Or vomit. Hey. And cry at the same time. And cough. Yeah. And cough. Cough yeah. and vomit. <laughs> cough and vomit. And sneeze. And sneeze. And spit. And cry. And what comes out of your ears? Um, earwax. <laughs> <laughs> These two glasses well, just poof. But that wouldn't feel as well. That would feel good if you were like cleaning your ears. Yeah. But earwax doesn't naturally just. Well, hold on. Let's hold really? the phone for a moment because I think we left the the pleasure piece of it behind a little mm -hmm. bit. Of, it was just before we got to coughing and vomiting at the same time. I think, unless those are pleasurable for you, they can be. If you feel really sick, sometimes you feel better after you vomit. Yeah, but it's kind of similar to a sneeze. I don't. I'm never like vomiting. I'm like, oh yeah, that really? is the spot. Yeah, <laughs> some people do, I think do. Does that happen to you? Um. Well, there's never a time where I feel like I really want to vomit because it would feel so good, you know. But, right. But if I feel sick, yeah, no, a I lot know there's times I feel times relieved. When, yeah, definitely. So it's similar to a sneeze, and and you know. I don't go around thinking, man, I really want to sneeze right now, but it's it's a relief because there's like this weird like buildup happening in my sinuses and mm -hmm. it's like kind of this weird itch and it feels good for that reason. Mm -hmm. It's almost like introducing pain and then applying some kind of balm to it and then feeling better. That works. That analogy to me works for the vomiting side of it, but not so much for the sneezing side. Like really? Yeah. I, for me, it really is more like after I sneeze, I'm just kind of like, oh man, that like it, there's a, like a little bit of a tingly feeling and it's kind of like, it's just nice. But that's like a, a reaction you had because there's like some for like foreign matter that entered your nostrils or something. I don't care why it is. I'm just saying like, that's what happens. Like I feel good. It's not like, oh, I was feeling shittier and shittier. This thing happens and I'm like, oh man, I feel good. It's not like the bad thing and then the removal of the bad thing. It's just, it's just a nice thing sometimes. Sometimes and it's, vomiting is expelling like you know, really bad stuff from your body. Right. And that's like why too I'm much saying, alcohol it, or some bacteria. Yeah, or it something. often is. But it that never that to me it's more like, yeah, just getting rid of the bad thing. Like there's that's obviously more positive, but it's never like it slips above zero for me as far as like Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think I think barfing can feel pretty good sometimes. Interesting. It's been a very long time since I barfed. Yeah, me too. And it's always been when I was way too drunk so i don't even know hard if, to appreciate it hard to, yeah if i appreciated what was happening if i was just that's the thing with you young drunks you don't even appreciate a good barfing but but going back to the okay so let's just leave out vomiting because it's a little bit too contentious mm. but, but vomiting uh, is the third rail controversial but mm -hmm. um you know you're peeing mm. you're coming yeah what about is poop does pooping feel good yeah it can right yeah farting Sometimes, yeah. Sneezing? Yeah. What about crying? Crying can be cathartic, right? Definitely, yeah. What about blowing your nose? Mm, 
I don't think so. Okay, sneezing. But sneezing, okay. I, that f- can feel good sometimes. Yeah. Coughing sometimes. That again is more like just I'll cough to try and get rid of whatever it is that's bothering me, but I'm never like, oh man, that cough was just a solid positive for me. But if you have a really productive cough sometimes, like you're sick and Mm -hmm. a lot of just mucus comes out, that can feel good sometimes. It's good because I have a feeling of accomplishment. Yeah. That's about it. Okay. Let's just leave out coughing then and vomiting. Yeah. But all those other things we mentioned. All those at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I probably couldn't handle it. You think you would die from the... I don't know. Probably. That's what it would be like, right? Yeah. And then, Except I can't do it simultaneously. I can't make all those sounds at once. And unfortunately, your your wish was to have your dying words etched onto your tombstone. So yeah. that's what you just did there as your epitaph. I want someone to sample all those sounds mm-hmm. and then play them simultaneously. And I don't want to hear what it sounds like. You want like a dubstep soundtrack kind of thing? Kind of. Like that. That would be a cool sound to play at your funeral, right? Just on loop. Simultaneous bodily functions that feel really good. He was such a good guy. He just, I can't think of enough nice things to say. Oh, oh, oh. Here comes the drop. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. Awesome indeed. I can't think of a better way to end the show. Me neither. Well, bye. Bye.